The first scripture I'd like to share with you today is from the book of Philippians in chapter 3 and verses 1 through 11. Let us hear the word of the Lord together. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone has mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Our second reading is a continuation of chapter 3 in the book of Philippians, verses 12 through 16. Again, may we hear the word of the Lord. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on in order that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude, and if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We are told in the secular world that if we want to be a success in life, we have to have goals. And it is very important that we write down our goals. For if you write down your goals, you will have a 20% greater chance of success and a 42% better chance of achieving the goals that you write down. And yet 13% of people who do write their goals have no plan for how to achieve them. So only 3% of people have both written down their goals and also have a plan for how to execute them. A staggering 84% of all people don't have any goals for themselves at all. And what exactly do goals do for us? Well, goals can help you stay motivated. Goals can make you accountable. Goals help you stay on track. Goals give you a way to measure your progress. And goals can provide us with a sense of accomplishment. Profoundly, there is some parallel truth to the Christian life. There are spiritual goals that are necessary for the successful Christian. But did you know that we already have those written goals for us in the scriptures? Paul wrote to the Philippian church and told them exactly what his spiritual goals were and how he was going to achieve them 
2,000 years ago. It was amazing. And what Paul was striving for is really what every Christian should strive to achieve. And what was his goal? Was it heaven's gates? Was it perfect obedience to the law? Was it faith that could move mountains? Well, as important as these things surely are, according to the text, his goal was actually something else. So today, we're going to hear not only what Paul's goal was, but what the goal of every Christian should be, and also how to achieve that goal. And yet, unlike these business goals and education goals and secular goals that promise the prize of money or power, the goal and the prize for the Christian is one and the same. But let's look at the Christian goal and how to achieve it. The prize, the goal and the prize, today's message. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, fill our hearts with the truth of your message that Paul, the apostle, understood that he had a goal for being a Christian and that you would help us all achieve that goal when we trust and know you. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Now, how much confidence should we place in our natural abilities to achieve some of these self-made, selfish goals. Paul wrote, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Paul had every reason, he said, to boast about what he had accomplished and the gifts that he had. Paul's self-made goal at one time was actually to rid the world of Christians. Paul also knew that everything that he had achieved in the flesh had done nothing to save him or bring him closer to God. And therefore, Paul was very hard on other people who taught that although Jesus was the way to the Father, the person still had to work to keep the laws and the ceremonial practices of the Old Covenant, the circumcisers, as he called them. Paul said that our salvation is dependent upon Christ alone through faith in him. And although Paul had every reason to brag before other people about how he had even kept the law, he had no reason to brag before God. In verses 7 through 9, he writes, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. So Paul counted all things he had done in his life in the flesh as just rubbish compared with the value of knowing Christ Jesus as his Lord. And remember that it wasn't until Paul knew that Jesus was Lord that he could even claim to know him. You know, there are people who attend churches at times that really don't know that Jesus Christ is Lord of all or they refuse to accept him as such. Friends, if you don't accept Jesus Christ as Lord, then you don't know him. But Paul had accepted that Jesus was Lord over his whole life and over the whole world. He said that he had suffered the loss of everything in order to gain Christ. And what was Paul referring to, these losses? Well, he had lost his prestige and honor in the Sanhedrin. He traded a highly respectable religious position for what was considered by most people of his day to just join a cult. He also suffered financial losses. He lost his worldly security. He even lost his health, he said, by being stoned and imprisoned and mistreated everywhere he went. 
And yet he still said, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord. What have we lost? What have we had to give up in order to know the fullness of Jesus Christ as our Lord? Is knowing Jesus Christ as Lord more important to you and me than anything else in our lives? I can point to many decisions that I've made in my life that were admittedly for my benefit alone. I can also point to some decisions in my life where I gave up what seemed to be beneficial to me or to my family, all for the sake of following Christ and the pleasure of being in right fellowship with him. Sisters and brothers, knowing Christ Jesus is more important than missions. It's more important than our prayers. It's more important than our budget or our building or even our worship. You can't worship him if you don't know him. Knowing Jesus Christ is so valuable that it is the goal and the prize of every true church and every true Christian of Jesus Christ. It is our salvation to know him. And Paul continues in what it means to know Christ and the depth of knowing Christ. He said that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. That's part of knowing him. And the fellowship of his sufferings. That's part of knowing him. Being conformed to his death. That's part of knowing him. In order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul not only wanted to know Christ in, in deep and profound and intimate ways. He wanted to know his power in his resurrection. He wanted to know his sufferings. Imagine to want to know Christ's sufferings. And yet one of the ways that we can intimately know Jesus Christ is when we go through difficult hardships and sufferings. It makes all the difference in the world that we perceive that Christ is with us through our trials and that we are experiencing just some small part of what he endured. Trials can help us to become more fully connected and dependent upon Christ. Paul counted it to be an honor to suffer for the sake of Christ, even to know just a portion of his sufferings. Do we consider it an honor to suffer for Christ or to, to know his sufferings, or do we consider that a burden? Have we even suffered for Christ at all? And then Paul adds that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that knowing Christ's sufferings means you're going to be raised, but that, that takes faith to believe these things. And faith brings about salvation and the resurrection. Brothers and sisters, we must know Jesus to attain to the resurrection of the dead. Know all about him. Not just some Jesus we make up for ourselves, as some people do in churches, but the Jesus of the scriptures. At the last judgment, Jesus will declare to some, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. We need to know him. Now imagine having that same power in your life that raised Jesus from the dead. That's what the apostle wanted. Not just for the power's sake, but to know Jesus. Friends, that is how we live victoriously in Christ. That's how we can live the Christian life. To have his power over sin and evil and even over death. Haven't you ever wanted the power of Jesus' resurrection in your life? That's what Paul wanted. Verses 12 through 14. Not that I have already obtained it or that I've already become perfect. Paul admitted he was still just a grievous sinner. But then he added something very crucial. But I press on so that I may 
lay hold of that for which I was also laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus laid hold of me for this goal. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but the one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You see, Paul desired above all things to be like Jesus Christ and to know him, even to strive for his perfection. And friends, this is the ultimate goal for every Christian, for Christ's resurrected life, to be like Jesus Christ and to know him, to be complete and mature and even perfect. This was confirmed by Christ's words in Matthew 5, 48. Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, someone says, well, you're joking. You, you've gotten lost in your own theology. I thought our goal was simply to go to heaven. Let's be real, preacher. No one, Christian or otherwise, can achieve the goal of Christ's perfection. Well, true, we cannot. You're right. Only Christ was perfect. But that doesn't mean that Christ's likeness should no longer be our goal. It must be our goal. Even though we will never achieve it in this life. And we will constantly struggle with it. And now we will struggle with our sinful nature. It is still the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. God called us to be like his son. To the power of the Holy Spirit. This is our spiritual goal in this life. And it's also the prize. Why? Because it's knowing Jesus. That's the prize. Heaven is, is given freely and it's given graciously to all those who accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's true. But the goal of this life as a Christian is more than just saying, I have a key to the afterlife, as wonderful as that will be. Paul said that he pressed on to perfection in order that he may lay hold of that for which Jesus Christ had laid hold of him. You see, it wasn't just Paul's goal. It was the goal of God who had laid hold of his life. You see, Christ has laid hold of you and me, not only that we might go to heaven, and that's great, that's wonderful, but that we might be remade in his image now. He laid hold of us that we might be changed, reborn, a new creation in Christ Jesus for this life as well as the next. If Christian churches in America didn't stop with people's discipleship as soon as they accepted Christ, maybe we'd have a greater dynamic in Christ's church which would change the world for the good. We are to continually be the disciples of Jesus and to know him personally and to grow in his image. Now why would God set such a lofty and unachievable goal for his people in this life? Did Jesus intend to make his teachings impossible? Why not just atone for sins and leave us alone? And then we'll get to go to heaven. Well, first of all, if God had set any goal for our lives in this life, any lower than this, then someone would already have claimed to achieve it. Okay, Lord, I'm going to heaven. That's, that's all there is to it. I guess I'm as good a Christian as I'll ever be then we might as well sin all the more that grace might abound because we're, after all, we're going to heaven. But this is not what God wants for our discipleship. Secondly, to set a goal of perfection in Christ should keep Christians humble, like those who walked with Jesus and saw perfection in him. Remember, Peter said to the Lord, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Thirdly, it means that there's always room for us to improve. We can never say that we have arrived. Like Paul said, I, I'm not, I haven't said I've arrived. 
Paul made sure the people that he wrote to in the church of Philippi knew that he didn't claim to have already arrived, but only that he was pressing on towards the upward call. Fourthly, to set such a lofty goal also points us to faith in Christ. Why? Because he's the only one to have ever achieved it. It actually points us to our need for a Savior. A Savior we need to know. Because if God is holy, he cannot be tainted by sin. He therefore demands perfection. And since we can only be seen perfect if we're in Christ, then we need a Savior in order to stand before a holy and righteous God. Even if it's our goal to be like Christ, we still need a Savior because we know we're not going to get there. And finally, Paul shared with how he worked towards achieving this goal in Christ. He said, the one thing I do is to forget what lies behind me and to reach for what lies ahead of me. The one thing I do is to forget what lies behind me and to reach for what lies ahead of me. Paul forgot what was behind him. What did he mean by that? Well, what was behind Paul in his life? All the history of his past, the persecution and murder of Christians, the legalisms and the disobedience to the very God that he was trying to please as a Pharisee. All that was behind him. And why were those things behind him? Because of the blood of Jesus Christ had cleansed him from all sin. Paul served Christ as though those things in his past had never happened. And here we understand a major reason why Christians do not grow as quickly as they might and they miss their goal. Because we don't let go of our past failures and sins. Even when we've been forgiven by Christ. Some people still kick themselves. They, they punish themselves. Some of these people drag in chains every Sunday to church. Oh, you can't see them, but they're there just the same. For guilt can be just as real and have just as much an effect on our lives as chains around our feet. Who can run the race that God has set before us with a ball and chain wrapped around his ankle? Oh, I remember when I really messed up, and everybody else does too. I knew a young couple that had gone through a divorce in the church that I had attended many years ago. Now, they were very embarrassed about it, and somehow, by the grace and the love of Christ, they forgave each other, and they got back together again. They were even remarried. And yet, the sad part of the story was that even though the man felt called to go into the ministry. He wouldn't do anything about it because he felt unworthy. And what was worse, the church itself would not let either of them teach or hold any office in that church. They were ostracized from any form of service, even though they were remarried to each other. That local church of Jesus Christ would not let them forget even after they repented. Isaiah 43.25 reveals that God both forgives and forgets our sins. And if that's true, then shouldn't the people of God at least forgive? Sometimes we will not forgive our brothers or sisters or let them forget their sins. We keep reminding them as if we were above God. We may not even forgive ourselves, and so perhaps we don't want anyone else to be forgiven. And yet there is another reason why Christians do not grow in their Christian walk as they might, and that is because they do not let go of what lies behind them in terms of their past achievements. They tend to want to bask in spiritual glory. Well, at one or more times in our life, we may have done something good for God. We may have obeyed Him in some special way. Maybe we taught Sunday school, or we served as an elder or deacon, or maybe we even decided to go through seminary. But then we rehearse and brag and talk about those achievements over and over again as though our job on earth were finished. Well, God has long since called us to move on and to do more. 
It reminds me of a couple of people sitting in rocking chairs on a front porch, Christians bragging to each other about something they did 40 years ago. You see, Paul said he counted everything he had done in his life as rubbish while pressing towards the goal. And that included not only his past of sins, but his good works and his good deeds before and after becoming a Christian. You and I are not to be satisfied with the achievements of our past. But then there's a third reason why Christians do not mature or grow in the faith like they should. And that is because we stop looking forward to what lies ahead of us. Maybe we don't believe it, but we don't look forward to it. We do not reach for anything more than what we already have and what we've already experienced. We can even become content with ambivalence. And so we have no spiritual goals, perhaps, and yet God has spiritual goals for us. God's plans are ahead of each one of us. God's heaven is ahead of each one of us. God's goal for your life and mine are ahead of us. Do you get up in the morning expecting God to work in your life during the day? We need to live more expectantly. God, what are you going to say to me today? God, what are you going to call me to do today? God, what are you going to do with me today? Paul said in verses 15 through 16 that if we are mature in the faith, we will show these kinds of attitudes towards ourselves and towards others. And God will reveal to us if we don't have the proper attitude for growth. What is God revealing to you today about your attitude about growth? In verses 17 through 19, Paul reminds us that if our goal is not to be like Christ, and our prize is not to personally know the Lord Jesus, then it must be that we have fleshly desires that have become our gods. And if we set our minds on the flesh and our appetites on the flesh, then we become enemies of the cross and we become enemies of the gospel. Verses 20 through 21 reveal that our goal and our prize is the same. We eagerly await the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will also transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory by the exertion of His power that He has even to subject all things to Himself. So the goal and the prize for Christians is simply this, to know Jesus, to know Him in His fullness and all that He went through, to be perfect like him to attain to his resurrection oh my beloved brothers and sisters press on towards the high calling of God in Christ Jesus and the way to achieve this goal is simple let go of all those things that lie behind you and reach forward to what lies ahead of you in Jesus Christ to God be all the praise and glory amen